Be Wealthy and Smart, episode 637. into a world of wealth and financial freedom without budgets, boredom, or bosses on Be Wealthy and Smart. And now, here's your host, Linda P. Jones. Welcome to Be Wealthy and Smart. I'm Linda P. Jones, America's Wealth Mentor, empowering women and men worldwide to financial freedom. On today's show, we're going to talk about the Fed cut interest rates again, what's next? And this is an article I found from Investors Business Daily. And it really summarized what's going on with the Fed. You know, I've been talking about the repo markets and I did part one and part two on that. There's a lot of things going on behind the scenes and the Fed has been pumping money into banks overnight while cutting interest rates. So let's take a look at this article and see what they have to say. And it says, the Fed lowered its benchmark interest rate to a range of 1.5 to 1.75% on Wednesday, as expected. But Fed Chief Jerome Powell made clear that only a material reassessment of the economic outlook would provoke a further Fed rate cut. Bottom line, the Fed's mid-cycle adjustment is complete. Despite the high bar to further Fed action, the Dow Jones turned solidly higher as Fed Chief Powell spoke. The Fed noted that uncertainties about the economic outlook remain, but downgraded their readiness to take action. The new statement indicated that the Fed will monitor incoming data as it assesses the appropriate path of monetary policy. September's wording noted that the Fed will act as appropriate to sustain the expansion. The takeaway is that the Fed no longer sees heightened vulnerability that may require an immediate response. What they mean by that is they're not seeing the risk of a recession, as they were saying before, and all the weakness that they were worried about and the inverted yield curve and all of that chatter that's been going on. They really feel like things are stabilized and they're not seeing a lot of that weakness anymore. It goes on to say, as with the prior two Fed rate cuts, Boston Fed President Eric Rosengren and Kansas City Fed President Esther George dissented, opposing any rate cut. Fed Chief Powell said that monetary policy is in a good place at the outset of his press conference. He said the Fed expects continued moderate growth. That suggests the growth outlook would have to take a significant leg down from the third quarter's 1.9% rise in real GDP to merit a rethink. As Powell spoke, financial markets pushed out the next Fed rate cut to June at their earliest. At that point, Fed rate cut odds top 50%, but just barely. So in other words, the market tells us what the chances are of a future rate cut, and Chairman Powell came out and said he wasn't planning to cut rates again until next June, and so immediately rates started to drop in anticipation of that, but only halfway toward that expectation. The stock market seemed to react positively to Powell's discussion of the Fed's rethinking of how to achieve its 2% inflation objective. He said it would take a big increase in inflation to spur a Fed rate hike, stressing the importance of making sure the U.S. avoids a long, disinflationary trend. Big picture, policy will have to remain accommodative. All right, then the article talks a little bit about the stock market's reaction and how the market was up a little bit and that the banks were doing well. Then it goes on to say, why did the Fed cut interest rates again? The Fed signaled at its September 18th, 19th meeting that an October rate cut looked doubtful. Projections issued at the meeting showed that only 7 of 17 policymakers expected another Fed rate cut in 2019. What changed? Not all that much. The same factors behind the July and September rate cuts remained in place. Soft global growth uncertainty due to trade friction, lower business investment, factory sector weakness, and muted inflation. Incoming data confirmed a significant slowdown in private sector hiring. Retail sales data showed the consumer took a step back last month, if only briefly. 
On the other hand, there have been some positives. The housing market has shifted into higher gear. President Trump announced a preliminary phase one China trade deal that suspended tariffs set to take effect on October 15th. Striking workers at General Motors voted to return to work, eliminating one near-term source of weakness. The stock market is essentially at record highs. Fed policymakers may have preferred to wait and see how the economy responded to easier monetary policy before cutting again. Yet perhaps the biggest change intermeeting was in financial market expectations. Overwhelming odds of a rate cut may have left the Fed little choice without risking an ill-timed sell-off. And the next section says Fed is running low on ammunition. After three Fed rate cuts spent to combat an economic slowdown, the Federal Reserve has to start thinking about maximizing its limited interest rate ammunition. After all, growth only has receded to 1.9%, which is close to what policymakers see as the economy's non-inflationary potential. So I just want to pause there for a minute and say, lowering interest rates is a way of stimulating the economy. So if interest rates keep going lower, if we really do get into a recession, then the Fed runs out of, quote, ammunition to really help the economy recover. So it's using up its ammunition now to prop up markets, put liquidity out there, keep interest rates low, keep the housing market high. And that's all well and good because that's usually what happens before an election is everything is running smoothly, but they're just pointing out that with interest rates so low, if there was any recession that happened, there's really not a lot of ammunition left to help us get out of that. It goes on to say, for monetary policy to work as intended, the central bank has to maintain credibility. Fed Chief Powell has talked about the importance of policymakers moving aggressively to counteract economic weakness. The risk is that the Fed could spend more of its ammunition in bite-sized morsels to counteract global economic uncertainty. Yet that might leave relatively little for a shock and awe campaign to combat more pronounced weakness should it arise. And the last section is called QE light. QE means quantitative easing. That's when the Fed is running the printing press, but essentially they're providing more liquidity to other banks. And it says, on October 11th, the Fed announced that it would start growing its balance sheet for the first time in five years, initially to the tune of $60 billion per month. Policymakers didn't change that plan at Wednesday's meeting. Unlike quantitative easing, QE, first launched at the end of 2008 amid the financial crisis, these purchases don't have an explicit goal of lowering long-term interest rates or boosting stock prices. Instead of buying long-term bonds to stimulate growth, the Fed is buying short-term treasury bills for purely technical reasons. Yet the burst of liquidity from the Fed may still add some fuel to financial markets, Wall Street expects the Fed to grow its balance sheet by about $350 billion. That should more than offset any negative impetus from the projected $1.1 trillion rise in federal debt. The asset purchases are intended to ease strains in money markets that have interfered with the Fed's ability to keep its effective benchmark interest rate where it wants. The effective federal funds rate has persistently crept toward the top of the range targeted by Fed policymakers. A rising federal deficit is among the factors creating a challenging backdrop for the Fed. End of article. Well, you see, one of the problems we have is that most of the debt is interest. And so if we were to raise interest rates, we would just be making our own debt worse and to grow larger with higher interest rates. So they're trying to keep that debt manageable, and that's one of the reasons why, I believe, they have wanted to lower interest rates is simply not to be charging more interest on the deficit and racking up the deficit even faster. This stimulus has been very good for the stock market. I think it will continue to be good for the stock market. As we heard in part two of my report on the repo markets, It seems like this is all in the end propping up the stock market because after all, where else can you go to get any return on your money? The lower that interest rates go, the less competition there is for the stock market because savings accounts and bonds that pay you interest 
just have such low rates that it's almost forcing money into the stock market. So we'll continue to monitor this and report to you what's going on and how the Fed is doing and any updates that we have as they continue to shore up the repurchase agreements among banks to promote stability. If you haven't yet subscribed to Be Wealthy and Smart, hit the subscribe button and you'll be notified as soon as new podcasts are available so you never miss one of them. And if you're only finding the most recent podcasts on iTunes, you can go to my website at lindapjones.com forward slash podcasts and find all 600 plus podcasts that I have there. There's a search box in the upper right hand corner. You can search for any term that you want to know about and you have a full library of wealth mentoring topics that I've created so that you can address whatever financial needs you have and step up your game to financial freedom. That's all for today. Until next time, live the good life and be wealthy and smart. Thank you for listening to Be Wealthy and Smart with Linda P. Jones. Share the wealth and tell your family and friends about the show. Check out our website, blog, and social media for more riches at www.bewealthyandsmart.com. I will leave a link to this article in the show notes.